All right, good morning, guys. Welcome to the team today. Going to get started here with a couple of announcements as guys are filtering in, grabbing their coffee and so forth. This is uh, week number eight in our team season out of 25. So we are uh, about a third of the way through the team season, which is a good thing. But I had a couple of announcements here. First of all, I was handed a little, um, some information about a car in the parking lot with its lights on. And it's a red car, not sure exactly what kind, maybe a Sable, something like that. But here's the license plate number, uh, Z941770. And so it, the person who saw this said the lights stayed on for a long time. Maybe they're automatic, maybe they're not. But if you have a red car with Illinois license plates, Z941770, it's a really cool car. So you can get up, it's no embarrassment. So you can get up and walk up. It's a nice car. And you can take care of that. Secondly, um, I did notice something today. I didn't notice up until now, but um, some tables just kind of go above and beyond with the theme and what we're doing at team, you know. And so I just want table one to hold up their, their, their mascot, their centerpiece. The, the, so I, I, think, I think we all need to, that, that's above and beyond right there. So, so I don't know if any of you are, uh, are, are artistically inclined, maybe, uh, maybe by next week a big giant paper mache thinker statue in the middle of your table, but something like that to keep us um, on track. And also the, the most important thing as we start today, um, it's a little unusual, but uh, I was reminded of this by some team guys this past week, but as you know, uh, tomorrow is November 11th, which is always designated as Veterans Day. And so a lot of the country is observing today. So what I wanted to do today as we start um, is if you are a vet, if you served in the armed forces at any point in your life, we'd just like to have you stand. Let's do that right now. Vets, stand up, please. We'd like to honor you and thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. And just out of curiosity, um, you don't have to stand, but how many of you had, uh, have fathers or grandfathers who served? Raise your hands. Look at that. That's pretty amazing. I, I, I love to do that because uh, I don't often think about it, but my grandfather, who I never knew, died when my dad was like five years old, served in World War I, and he's got like one picture of his father standing with his um, division on the way to France. And then my dad had two brothers, my uncles that I never knew, never met, served in World War II. Uh, my dad didn't serve, he was too young for World War II, I was too young for Vietnam. But um, I love to see, it's important to see how many guys are connected to people, or have served or are connected to people serve. The last question is, and I forgot to ask this before, if you have a son or daughter who's serving right now, raise your hand. Okay, thank you for that too. I think, I don't know who it was in history. I was thinking about it driving over this morning. I don't know if it was Churchill or FDR. Somebody said, never have so many owed so great a debt to so few. Uh, it's a great line, and I think that's true uh, in our culture today. Um, here's our story for today. A ventriloquist, any story that starts with a ventriloquist has hope and promise, okay? So you have, you have hope and promise right now. A ventriloquist is performing with this dummy on his lap, and he's telling a dumb blonde joke when a young platinum-haired beauty jumps to her feet. Hey, mister, what gives you the right to stereotype blondes that way, she demands. What does hair color have to do with my worth as a human being? The ventriloquist is flustered. He begins to stammer out an apology, but the blonde is incensed. She, sells, she yells, you keep out of this. I'm talking to that little jerk on your knee. <laughs> Not sure that fulfilled the promise. <laughs> the, qu <laughs> the question we're dealing with today is, who do you say that I am? Some of you realize that Jesus asked that question in the New Testament, and I'm calling it the question of lordship. That's kind of an unusual word. We don't use that word in our common everyday conversations very often, but it simply refers to authority. Who or what has the position of authority in our lives? And I want to show you a clip uh, Kind of uh, odd the way my brain worked to find this one, but it's about football and it's one of my favorite movies. But the movie, in the movie Remember the Titans, um, tells the story of a high school in Virginia, T.C. Williams High School in Virginia, 
in 1971, it's a, basically a true story. It's been adapted a little bit, but they were going through the issues having to do with se- uh, desegregation and brought in an African-American football coach. And this is the story of how this team of, of white kids and African-American kids came together uh, with their coach. And this is right at the beginning as he's establishing his authority as coach. Let's watch the scene. You have just disrupted my first team meeting in an unacceptable fashion. This is my team. Now, either you're with that or you're not. I'm here, ain't I? Let's talk football. Let's talk football. I run the defense. As a part of my team strategy. Now, I have never seen an assistant coach's name in the newspaper for losing a game. I want a job for Coach Tyrell. He's been with me for 10 years. I won't leave him out in the cold. You don't get me without him. You're overcooking my grits, Coach. All right. I will allow Coach Tyrell to coach the special teams, but I will have my eye on him. And you. Good morning, good morning, good morning, coaches. How are you? Good morning to you. How are you? Looks good today, doesn't it? Just wanted to let you know what the offense is doing. An awful skinny playbook, ain't it? Yeah, well, I run six plays, split beers like Novocaine. Just give it time, always works. See you on the bus. Be patient, Bill, the time will come. Perfect. Here we go. Here we go. I'm gonna help you boys. I'm Gary Bertier. The only All-American you got on this team. You want any of us to play for you? You reserve half the open positions for Hammond players. Half the offense, half the special teams. We don't need any of your people on defense. We're already set. Uh huh. Don't need none of my people. Mm hmm. What do you say, your name was uh, Jared? Gary. No, you must have said Jerry, like Lewis, which would make you Dean Martin, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, got an announcement to make. We got Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin going to camp with us here this year. Jerry tells the jokes, Dean sings the songs, and gets the girl. Let's give him a round of applause. Where's your folks, Gary? Parents, are they here? Where are they? That's my mother. That's your mama? Mm-hmm. Very nice, I want you. Take a good look at it. Because once you get on that bus, you ain't got no mama no more. You got your brothers on the team, and you got your daddy. Now, you know who your daddy is, don't you? <laughs> Jerry, if you want to play on this football team, you answer me when I ask you, who is your daddy? Yeah, that scene keeps going, it keeps going. Who's your daddy, Gary? Who's your daddy? You are, you are. Well, Coach Boone is challenging his, that young man um, to identify who has the authority on that football team. And he wants Gary to identify him as head coach. Now, the issue of authority comes up in the New Testament. It's a, uh, an odd transition, and it's done in a different way. But in Matthew chapter 16, the passage that's in your booklet, let me read this to you and explain it to you, then we'll break it apart. Matthew 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, let me pause there. Caesarea Philippi was an ancient city located to some 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, so way to the north of ancient Israel, even modern-day Israel. And at that point, in that city, there was a, a well-known pagan temple devoted to the Greek god Pan. Um, And it was located near the entrance of a deep cave that bubbled up uh, springs of water. And uh, ancient pagan mythology believed that cave to be one of the gates of Hades, one of the gates of hell itself. That's important because that's the context in which Jesus says these things. So that's where they are, the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, the Son of Man um, is a title given to the Messiah in the Old Testament, and it was how Jesus often referred to himself. So he's talking about himself here. Verse 14, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? 
Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now, a couple things before we even get into our material today. First of all, there's a centuries-old dispute about what Jesus meant by the phrase, on this rock, I will build my church. The Roman Catholic Church throughout the centuries has traditionally seen this as Jesus talking about Peter himself that on Peter he would build his church. And that begins the papacy, and every pope from the pope today going backwards has their roots in Peter the apostle, the rock on whom Jesus would build his church. Protestants, however, tend to see the rock Jesus is talking about as the confession made by Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So there's a slight difference in, in, in the origins of the thought between these two great streams of the Christian faith. We're gonna re- not going to resolve that today, but just for your information. Second, notice that Jesus seems to tell the disciples to keep his identity a secret. And it's kind of a weird thing. He's saying, who do you say that I am? Peter coughs it up. You are. And then he says, don't tell anyone. Seems kind of odd. Well, this is all about timing. Jesus does this several times early in his public ministry because he knows that once that gets out, once he makes the direct claim to be the Son of God, the Messiah, that everything is going to fast forward to the cross. And he's, it's not time yet. So he's telling them, you know this, but I don't want to go in public quite yet because it's not yet my time. So the question is, who do you say that I am? First thing I want to talk about today is who or what is your God? Who or what is your God? God there is with a small g. Think about it this way. Imagine a thousand years in the future. Imagine we're a thousand years into the future of the human race, if global warming or little rocket man doesn't get us first, okay? Let's say archaeologists are digging around in 3017. They're digging around in the ruins of 21st century North American culture. And they find in those ruins, uh, ruins of enormous arenas, giant stadia in every major city in North America, and smaller arenas in all the smaller parts of, 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 the, of the region. It's kind of like when we go to visit the Colosseum in Rome. They find ruins of these giant arenas. And in those ruins of these arenas, they find images, sometimes carved into the walls, of bears and panthers and jaguars and lions and images of helmeted warriors with faces painted and dressed for battle. And they would conclude, perhaps, that the peoples of the 21st century were barbaric and violent. That just like their Roman ancestors, they gathered in huge throngs, huge coliseums to watch blood sports, gladiator fights between men and beasts. Okay? Now let's say they um, unearth ruins of what we call the suburbs. They see vast grids of dwelling places. And as they dig into those dwelling places, they find every home has at least one room oriented around a glowing electronic device on one of the walls. And they would conclude that this might be where ancient families gathered to worship some kind of electronic deity. And then they would go in the back of each home and they'd find wooden platforms with small metal boxes that at one time contained fire where meat could be cooked and burned, and they would conclude that this is where 21st century families gathered to offer burnt sacrifices to their gods. Now, if they came to those conclusions, and of course I'm just tongue-in-cheek here, but if they came to those conclusions, they would not be entirely wrong, would they? Because what is a god, small g? A god is whatever or whoever you worship, and worship is defined by offering extravagant devotion to something or someone. So a God is anything to which we offer extravagant devotion. Now, all human beings worship something. Let me say that again. All human beings worship something. Because human beings are hardwired to worship. That is to offer extravagant devotion to something. We can't help it any more than we can help breathing air. Every human being who's ever lived worships something, even if they don't call it a God. The only question is who or what do we worship? We talked about identity a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned that at one point in my life, 
um, in my high school and college years, my identity was wrapped up in, be, in being an athlete, in particular being a basketball player. And the truth is, basketball was more than my identity in those years. In many ways, basketball was also my God, small g. For, for I wouldn't have said that at that time. If you had asked me, I said, well, I believe in Jesus. I go to church. But a God, small g, is that which orders your priorities, that which gives your life meaning and purpose, that which gives you your identity. And for me, if I was honest at that time, I woke up thinking about it. I thought about it during the day. I evaluated myself by it. It was the reason that I lived. It's where I found my identity. So it was my God, small g. Ancient cultures like the Egyptians and the Romans had all kinds of gods. The Egyptians had the sun god, Ra. Uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans had gods of, and goddesses of fertility, gods of the harvest, gods of the sea, and so forth. That all seems kind of superstitious and primitive to us. But the truth is, our culture, even now, has many gods with a small g. Things to which we offer extravagant devotion. Let me offer just a couple. Money, for example. It's ironic that printed on our currency in this country, we have the phrase, in God we trust. That's ironic. Because the truth is, we often trust far more in money than we do in God with the big G. We look to money or wealth for purpose, for security, for peace, for hope. But money is a lousy God. Many of us have already discovered that. Or let's say, for example, something more trivial like sports. We saw a great example of this just last fall, a year ago, when the Cubs won the World Series. I, try, I was a fan, obviously, and it was a fun thing to do, but I watched, it was a, it really interesting to watch the power of that event for millions of people to experience euphoria and joy and community and purpose for life when 25 young men that I don't even know were playing baseball, when you think about it. It's a powerful thing. We offer extravagant devotion. Let's take sex, for example. We don't have goddesses of fertility in our culture, per se, but our culture does use the sexualized form of females to sell everything from beer to pickup trucks. We offer extravagant devotion. So the first question to consider and just think about is who or what receives our extravagant devotion? Second question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Famous talk show host Larry King uh, was once asked, what person from human history would you most like to interview if you could and why? And he said, to the surprise of the interviewer, I'd like to interview Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the person said, why? It was kind of surprising. And then he said, because I would ask her if the virgin birth is true. Because if that's true, it changes everything, he said. What he meant, of course, is that if Jesus entered human life without the participation of a man in the process, then it means he came from God. He's a miracle, and that changes everything. It would mean the most important question in human experience is not what to do about global warming or what to do about North Korea or whether or not to trade Javi Baez. The question is, who is Jesus? Look at the text again, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now notice, even in the first century, even when Jesus of Nazareth was walking around in the flesh and blood, doing and saying things, there was a debate about who he was. I mean, he was right there. And there was a debate. Some said John the Baptist, an important spiritual teacher. Some said Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets who called people to obedience to God. And the same is true today in a way. If you stopped one of your coworkers or a neighbor or a friend and just asked them, hey, who is Jesus to you? What do you think about Jesus, this guy? Most would say something like, well, he was a great spiritual teacher, taught peace and love for all human beings. Some would say, well, he's probably mostly mythology that may have been a real guy somewhere in there, but the whole resurrection thing is a mythology fabricated by followers to keep the movement going and so forth. Some would say the entire story is a fairy tale. Some would say Jesus was and is the Son of God who became flesh, lived a sinless life, was crucified, dead, buried, rose again on the third day. When it comes down to it, there are really only two answers to the question. Either Jesus was just a guy, just another guy, kind of either a phony cult leader or religious nut job, or 
he was who he said he was. I'm gonna read a quote from C.S. Lewis. This is a longer quote than I like to read, but it's so good that it stands the test of time. So listen, it's in this book, Mere Christianity, which you've never read. You should read that. It's a challenging book, but it's a good, it's, it's a uh, powerful book, Mere Christianity. He's, he writes, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. That is, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. Because a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something far worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. It's a great quote. How can we know? Who Jesus is. Well, let me just tick through three things. This is not the place to go through in detail in any of these things. But let me tick through, through three ways we can know. First, literary evidence. Literary evidence. The New Testament in your Bible is made up of a, a bunch of eyewitness accounts, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, combined with personal letters written by the Apostle Paul, who had a personal experience with Christ. Um, and it comes to us as a, a literary piece, as a literary work. And so the question that people who study these sort of things ask is, how reliable is the actual document? How reliable is the document we have? And if you compare the New Testament in terms of stuff like how many ancient copies do we have? How close are those copies to when the original events took place? So how reliable are they as eyewitness accounts? If we compare these documents to any other ancient document, Plato, Aristotle, Julius Caesar, uh, works of Socrates, they, the Bible, the New Testament is a hundred times more reliable, a hundred times at least, than all these other documents that we readily accept as history and true. Literary evidence. You can do that research yourself. Secondly, evidence from history. I've often said that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is one of the most historically verifiable events in all of human history. And yet many regard it as a complete fairy tale. How is that possible? Here's how I, here, here's how I think about it. Jesus was ex executed in roughly the year 30 AD by the Roman Empire, the most powerful military, political, and economic system in the world at that time. Jerusalem, and this is what most people don't realize, at that time where his execution took place was what we would call a small town. Roughly 40,000 people living in a one square mile space. So think of, you know, G G Geneva, St. Charles, kind of put into one town. Not a giant place. There weren't that many cemeteries. There weren't that many places of execution. All this took place in public, okay? So Jesus is crucified publicly. His body put into a tomb with an armed Roman guard. Everybody knew exactly where he was. And two days later, two days, all the power of Rome could not find one dead Jewish guy to stop this rumor. They couldn't find one dead Jewish man. And they all knew where he was. Somebody has to explain that. Now, the story that was concocted was this, the disciples stole his body. So they stole his body, and then they all died for something they knew was a lie. You have to explain. That's why I say, and all of human history changed from that moment. So you have to explain how that happened. I think it's historically verifiable because the eyewitnesses are telling the story, and the documents are reliable, and so forth. The, but the third most powerful way is personal experience personal experience. The Bible tells us Jesus rose from the dead and therefore lives today in the form of the Holy Spirit. And at the point of faith, Jesus in spiritual form comes to dwell in, live in our hearts, and takes his place as Lord. That is, one we follow, one we serve, and we have relationship with him, personal experience. So the third question I want to ask you today is what difference does it make? Who is your God? Who is Jesus? And what difference does any of it make? I want to read a text to you now from the Apostle Paul. Uh, I don't think I printed this in your book, but it's 1 Corinthians 15. So just listen to what Paul says. He's making the argument for the resurrection of Christ. He says, 
And if Christ has not been raised, so he's taking the opposite argument. If Christ has not been raised, if he's not who he says he is, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. In other words, it's meaningless, absolutely meaningless. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died, have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. He's putting it all on the line. If this is not true, the Bible you hold is not worth the paper it's printed on, and you're still in your sins. His next line is, but in fact, Christ has been raised. Which means the question, who is Jesus, is the central question of all human history. Who is Jesus is the central question of every single human life because through Jesus, we can know God, big G. Through Jesus, we can have new hearts through forgiveness of sin. Our sins are covered, are dealt with because through Jesus, we have new identity. We are adopted into his family. I know who I am because he tells me who I am. Through Jesus, we have new purpose. I know I have a Lord who I serve. I know who the boss is. I know who the coach is. Because through Jesus, we have new destiny. That is eternal life. Here's the question again. Who do you say that I am? Because the answer to that question tells us who we worship, where we give our extravagant devotion, and it also determines our eternal destiny. Here's the questions I want you to deal with around the table today. First, if a God, small g, is that to which we offer our extravagant devotion, what was your God when you were 20 years old? Explain. If that's the way I define it, what was your God when you were 20 years old? I already told you mine when I was 20 years old. My God probably was basketball. Okay? Explain. Secondly, when and how did you come to believe that Jesus is more than just a religious figure from history? How did that process happen for you? We do this often. It's, it's, it's important to, for us to identify and retell our stories. So see how far you get in those two stories. I have the prayer cards up here. If you need to find me and give me a prayer concern, you can do that in the next 20 minutes or so. I'll wrap you up for prayer time about 6.52 or so. 